myths, lies, rumours, all these sort of things. Anyway, today is Myth Day. Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, whatever time of day you're watching this. I hope you're enjoying yourself because uh, I am. I've been working on this one for a little while. So if you want to make comments at the end, that'd be great. You put them in the comment box underneath and, uh, you know, they'll have a discussion on it. Anyway, today's subject. Today's subject, tape myths. This is what I've been wanting to do for a while and I think it should be good. If you want to discuss anything, put it in the comments and we can have a discussion on it. Let's get the world talking. Life doesn't have to be complicated, let's keep it simple. Hey, got there in there. Right, okay, tape myths. First tape myth is the type zero. There is no such thing as a type zero. Type one is a type, type two is a type, type three is a type, type four is a type. And this is not myth, this is real life. These one, two, three and four. Ferrous, chromium dioxide, well, chrome, very chrome, and metal. Metal being a weird word, because they're all metal, but anyway, yeah, metal, metal type. Type zero is the mythological concept. It's a slang term. It is something that is used, is used purely as jargon. It's very useful, helpful, but mustn't be misused. Type zero means that it's a no-name make, and the performance is not really, is not really up to it. It's subpar. It's not an excellent sounding tape, even. You could say that. It's a tape that just sounds really naff. Normally hissy. It must not, in my opinion, be used to describe a good tape that's gone bad. If you've got yourself a Sony that deteriorated for some reason, it's not a Type Zero. It is a crap tape. It's a bad tape. It's a tape that's had a bad time, but it is not a Type Zero. It was good at one point, and now it's not. Good tape sounds best in good decks is another myth. Or is it? Good tape sounds best in good decks. Good decks can make a mediocre tape sound good. Um, good tape sounds best in good decks. Good decks can make mediocre tape sound good. Well, for my money, it's number two. Good decks can make mediocre tapes sound good. Because good decks you can adjust. And a mediocre tape, you can try and get some of the problems that it's got sorted out by or just in the deck. Things like playback sensitivity, record sensitivity, um, the actual distortion factors and whatever, you can adjust the thing so that when it's in your deck it actually looks like the numbers that you're getting are what you're getting and that's fine. If it's a not particularly good tape the deck will will limit itself down. If it is a very good tape it will, it will allow itself the freedom but because you've adjusted it. But the first statement, which good tape sounds best in good decks, that's the one I'm going to argue with. But I'll argue with that a little bit later. Don't let me forget. Here's one. You should get the best deck and use the best tape to get the best results. True or false? Well, I would say true and false. Why? The truth is that you need the tape that responds best in your deck. Now, if you've got an excellent deck that does very, very good on the recordings, you need a tape that's going to be able to deal with it. But on the other hand, if you get a tape that doesn't match your deck, doesn't matter how good your deck is, it's not going to work. It's like putting what we in the UK used to call five-star petrol back in the day, or super premium or whatever, high-octane petrol. If you go and put that in a 2CV, it's not going to go any better. In fact, it may, not, it may actually damage it. But if you put that into a Veyron, Ferrari or a Porsche, you're going to get slightly better results than if you put in the standard 95 octane that you'd get otherwise. So, you know, horses for courses. Oh, what, nothing like a nice mixed metaphor. Put the right horse in your tank. There you are. Anyway, the truth is that you need to take the response best to your deck. I would say that is absolutely true. And that will give you the optimum performance. Now, what that means is if you find that you've got a deck with, we'll say, I don't know, a Sony from the mid 80s. It's a good deck, but it's not a three header. You haven't got any optimization controls on it, but it really loves a TDK CD into. Well, why would you put anything different in? You can try something different, buy one, and then if you find it doesn't work as well as a CD into, go back to the CD into. Why struggle? Why go around mur murdering tape reputations by saying that the, the Bassif is no good, but the CD into is wonderful? Because it just happens that on your deck, it doesn't match your deck. But on everybody else's deck, maybe it does. If you've got a Grundig deck, tape from Bassif will run much better than if you've got a JVC deck. But maybe you just need to adjust the thing with what you've got. I've got a video on that. Have a look at the one about the Bassif 
on the W1200. You can see the results I've got on there. You can see what I'm talking about. My deck can get the best out of any tape. That cannot be true, because you need to decide what the best is. Got a little story for you. <laughs> it means you want to get things right. We had a load of video recorders, and they were great. They were doing really good jobs. And we had a rep came along, and he sold us a different brand of tape. Now, according to him, the tape they had was better. And according to him, it would give better results, which was not really the way it worked. Well, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what the actual story was. They had the tape and it had a better high frequency response and um, a better noise response. So he sold it to the buyer on the basis that it was a better tape. What it actually meant was that we had to realign every machine to be able to use this better tape. Because the tape was slightly, what I would call, out of spec. If you bought the tape that the manufacturer recommended, which had to be a Sony, then the, these machines gave excellent performance. But if you bought this other tape, they didn't. You actually got the video equivalent of clipping. It was um, it was nasty. It wasn't nice at all. But they did buy thousands of these tapes, and so we had to adjust them. And then we had to try and come up with a compromise whereby the standard tape would work okay, but the new tape would work okay as well. Which actually meant that none, of, nobody got the best results because it just didn't. You can't do that. So that's a myth for you. My deck can get the best out of any tape. So that cannot be true because of what you need to decide the best is. Is the best the fact that you get a more reliable recording, or is the best the fact that you get a bright recording, or is the best the fact you get a quiet recording? As in the noise is down. You, you've got to decide what best is, or is best the fact that you've played the tape a hundred times and it still works. It sounds good. Uh, you could have a really wonderful tape that sounds absolutely gorgeous and it's only good for 50 plays. What would that be? Is that a best tape or is that a crap tape? Do you see what I mean? These questions are not that easy. The graphs on the back of new cassettes. Now there's an interesting one. Do you remember? Many, 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 many years ago. I'm talking about 1970s, 1980s, 1990s. <sighs> 2000s, they were selling these little things, they were, they were you know, about that big, oh, ooh, they looked a bit like that. Yeah, look, there we go. That is a cassette. Ha <laughs> ha. Now you'll recognise that as being a cheap tape. Well, it's not, actually, that wasn't a cheap tape. That was an EMI high dynamic, and that was quite expensive. Um, it was a good tape at the time. I haven't checked one recently, I, I will do a video on it. But that was a very good tape at the time. Wasn't the cheapest tape available, but it was one of the best ones at the time. Anyway, they used to produce, on the back of them, they used to have pictures. And they looked a bit like graphs. Well, most of them looked like graphs. But what were they about? Well, I've been doing some research. Look at these. And this. And this. And this, I'm going to go to voiceover now and I'll talk you through them. Looking at this uh, SR54, you can see there it's got a flat frequency response, near enough, 0.6 millimeters track width, and it's got 250 nanowebs for the 0 dB. But that doesn't really tell you much else, except there is a thing there that says minus 20 dB. That uh, is actually referring to the input signals being at minus 20 dB. Now the Scotty Mag's got, uh, it's written in English, it says minus 20 dB, and again it shows a good level signal. Trouble is, it says zero, but they're not talking about actual level, they're talking about deviation from that level. Onto a realistic super tape, M M460. Now that means it's a metal tape, and that's fine. But if you look at this, you can see it's got a slight curve, and it says it's in dB minus and plus. So I don't know what they're trying to say there. They don't tell us what the input level is, but it is curved. Looking at this one, you can see the passive are trying to tell you that their chrome is better than their ferrous. But we knew that, which is why we bought a chrome, I assume. I'm assuming it is actually a graph, and there is something there if you really study it, but it, it doesn't relate to the other ones that we've seen, so therefore it's really useless. To prove my point about consistency, here is another passive chrome extra too, and it's got a totally different sort of graph on it, which bears no relationship to the other one, other than the fact that it's curved. SKC were good, I used to sell them in my shop, and if you look at this it says that it's got a slight down at, well it's actually showing as being at minus 20 dB, which is good, but it says slightly down on the base and it's slightly high on the treble, so it's saying that you've got a brighter tape there, 
but they're actually showing it as being minus 20 dB, which nobody else has done. They were really important, they'd be on the actual body of the cassette. Need to know will always be printed on the equipment, or at least in the instructions for use. It will tell you what to do, why it is important. The biggest clue is that they only put them on some of the cassettes. They are not on all. So you can buy a, a TDKD from 1989 and it will have a, a graph on the back of it. You can buy one from 1988 and it won't. You can buy one from, from 1999, 19, uh, 2000 or whatever and it will possibly not have it on it again. I've been doing an awful lot of research on this. There are a lot of tapes out there that only have them on for a little while. In fact, it may be helpful. Now, the information on these graphs, sometimes it's just, no. If you look at them, they, they're not normally scaled correctly. They haven't got enough information that you can actually tell exactly what they're doing. The graphs look pretty, mostly, and they are something to fill the back up. And at certain points, we actually ended up looking at them to see what they were there. But what do they mean? Do they actually have any information that's of use? Mostly, they show freeze response. They mostly show as being flat, because that's actually what you want. If you've got freeze response that isn't flat, you've got yourself something wrong. And um, you've got controls for that, that's why you have graphic equalizers and stuff, but you shouldn't be going for it. This is the Maxwell XV90, and if you see, this is a freeze response sweep. This is done at 0 dB, and you can see there's a hell of a drop. And then you've got that sort of bit at the bottom which goes across. Now, in a second, I'm going to show you the one that was done at minus 20. This one was done at minus 20, and it's as good as an illustration as any that, as to why they do all these things at minus 20. That's got a pretty good flat freeze response up to about 15k, then it tails off a bit. But compare that to the original one at 0 dB, and you can see there is no comparison. And before anybody says, oh, it should have been done on a decent deck, the results have been different between the tapes, even if consistent in shape. So it's not the deck that's cutting off the response, it's the tapes. So looking at these charts, you can see here that there's a difference between the Maxell and that one, which is the Fuji, which I just did the other day. And you can see that the Maxell is a little bit um, noisier, a little bit cruder than the Fuji. That's why I described the Fuji as just beautiful. The levels are different, so that's all down to mole and stuff like that. But you wouldn't get that from the charts, and you wouldn't know that from the packaging. The relevance with my charts is that they've all been done at the same level, so you are actually comparing like to like and seeing what the differences are. A few of them have gone in for a thing called mole, which is maximum output level. Now, apparently that's quite important. As they don't all have the same information on them, you can't compare. They just are not the same thing. They usually are comparing to a different tape in their own range which is not relevant because you didn't buy that one, you bought the one you've got in your hand. And you didn't know you, you didn't know if it's going to be any better, you assumed it was, which is why you paid more money for it. What you need to do is you need to have a competitor's tape in comparison, which is why none of the graphs are exactly the same, so you can't. It's called fuzzy marketing. Give people information, but don't give them enough to actually make it relevant to anybody else. That way, you can claim to be the best. I saw one yesterday. It's the best something or other in the USA. It's a world-class leader and it was the most popular one in the USA. Graphs do not often give the reference points that are able to be compared to other graphs and charts. And some are just pictures. I can show you, you've looked at one of those, I'll show you it again. Now some of the important things on here are to think about this. If you've got a tape that you are recording on and it says that it's got a higher frequency response and it shows it on the graph on the back, <gasps> breathe. <laughs> if you've got all of that, you'll find that, that the um, what they're trying to tell you is it's got a higher freeze response. Well, if you've got yourself a really good deck like a Nakamichi Dragon, you can you can uh, optimize that to get the best, and you're going to get a response up to 20 kilohertz flat. And if you've got yourself a less good tape, you can optimize that on the Nakamichi Dragon, and you will get a flat freeze response up to 20 kilohertz flat. Or you can get yourself a really mediocre tape that nobody else can play very well and you can optimise that and you can get yourself a really good flat response to 20 kilohertz. Um, so what are you going to get? Well, well, what you're going to get is you're going to get slightly different, slightly different hiss values, slightly different noise values, but you're not going to get a better actual freeze response. But if you've got yourself a tape that has got a higher freeze response on the graph than the previous version of that tape and you've got yourself a boom box that has not got any controls on it other than hit these two buttons to record 
that machine will get itself a slightly better high frequency response because well if the graph isn't lying what it's telling you is that for the same settings as standard which would be the IEC and whatever else settings for the same settings as standard you will get this slightly better response at the high end now I've got a couple of decks with um, a automatic equalization and I've got one with manual equalization you've probably seen the video if you haven't then go and have a look it's quite interesting I say that in a historical sort of way or oh, was that hysterical oh anyway um, anyway go and have a look at that video and you'll see what I mean but what you're doing is you're adjusting with these systems, whether they be the automatic ones or not, you're adjusting to get a flat frequency response. So when you get a graph that shows a non-flat frequency response, what you're actually doing is you're having to turn down the, the high frequencies if that's what you've got, or you're having to turn down the low frequencies if that's what you've got, because you want them to be flat. You do not want to have heavy bass and heavy treble, because that's not hi-fi, that's not fidelity, that's distorting the sound. I think that's just about covered it. Don't believe everything you read, don't believe everything you're told, don't believe everything that's around. Have a look, use your own eyes, see what's what, and you can find out some informa information that actually makes some sense and is useful. The more you pay does not necessarily mean the better you get, but it's a good guide, and if that makes any sense to you, then great. If you've got anything out of this video, then give us a thumbs up, give us a share, do whatever. Um, it'd be nice if you could subscribe, make, the, make it all worthwhile, and um, I might continue this subject, but I think that just about covers it. Catch you again. Bye-bye.